Cheers a big one. There is perhaps no more famous video game level than Super Mario Bros. World 1-1, the first stage of the game that saved video games outside of Japan, the first stage in the largest video game franchise in the world, the first stage that many children would ever touch or learn from. And it's probably among the most well-covered levels for analysis, only Green Hill Zone approaching it due to everyone being Sendere for Sonic level design discussion. Shigeru Miyamoto has done multiple interviews on the level, well-respected essayists have weighed in. All there is to do now is consolidate and extrapolate. One One's impact cannot be overstated, but it is ultimately still a level. This video endeavors to look at 1-1 from a historical perspective, see what it and Super Mario Bros.'s construction meant to gaming at the time, and break down each of its individual aspects to see how they informed a player on how to play, and how it can still aid designers to this day in their level design. We will leave no stone unturned, we shall break down 1-1, brick by brick. The year is 1985. Calvin and Hobbes debuts in newspapers. Michael Jordan is awarded the NBA's Rookie of the Year. The Black Cauldron is released in theaters and nearly bankrupts Disney despite the cinematic genius of Gurgi. And Nintendo is planning the next phase of the Famicom's life cycle with the Famicom Disk System. The disc system was a unique add-on, allowing the Famicom to play modified Mitsumi Quick Disc floppies that allowed for better sound, cheaper game distribution, and perhaps most importantly, increased the size of Famicom games from a paltry 40 kilobytes to a whopping 112 KB. With a behemoth of a game, The Legend of Zelda, headlining the Disk System's releases, developers at Nintendo were tasked to create what they were sure would be the culmination of the Famicom's cartridge life cycle, the exclamation point at the end of cartridge games. Directors Shigeru Miyamoto and Takeshi Tezuka, programmers Toshihiko Nakago and Kazuaki Morita, and composer Koji Kondo got to work on the classic Famicom's finale. Tezuka and Miyamoto had first worked together making 1984's Devil World for the Famicom. The game featured large, vibrant sprites that dwarfed previous Famicom characters. A month later, another Miyamoto project, Excitebike, was released, featuring a swift, horizontal scroll controlled by the player, rather than a static screen. Miyamoto and Tezuka took these concepts, among others taken from games such as Donkey Kong and Popeye, and sought how to mash them together, fitting their favorite elements like the large sprites, the scrolling screen, and the platforming basis together for the ultimate Famicom cartridge. Of course, platforming games with side-scrolling had been done before. Jump Bug had force-scrolling in addition to platforming back in 81, Namco's Pac-Land had just been released with controllable scrolling, and Ghosts and Goblins was entering development, but Miyamoto and Tezuka took an incredibly dedicated approach for their Famicamera. Each level was hand-drawn on graphing paper by Miyamoto or Tezuka. Consideration for how to use every bit of space was taken into account to make a maximum size cart, and level drafts were turned around incredibly quickly, the entire undertaking being completed in roughly seven months. Expanding on every concept and revisiting all their favorite ideas and accomplishments, this was the game's decided heroes, the Mario Brothers, going beyond the Call of Duty. This was the genesis of Super Mario Brothers. Now, what does this all have to do with 1-1 specifically? Well, everything that Super Mario Brothers aspired to be needed to be communicated in the game's opening moments. Everything from the first moment that a player looks at the screen needed to exhibit Miyamoto and Tezuka's vision. The background was to be a vibrant blue to show off the potential of the Famicom showing brighter, more visually appealing worlds. 
Clouds use the same sprite work as bushes in different palettes in order to make the space feel more lived in, and also getting the most out of assets with very limited cartridge space. Koji Kondo's music was developed with no genre in mind, him putting the feeling he got while playing the game directly into his score. Miyamoto and Tezuka were creating a Super Mario world as much as they were a game, one that they wanted players to explore more than any other game had let them previously. World 1-1 starts with the player in complete safety. Mario is oriented toward the left side of the screen, a rarity in Super Mario Bros. as the plumber is normally centered on screen, inviting the player to fill in the empty space. Now, a cautious player might experiment with what the buttons do here, but let's assume the player simply discovers, hey, there's no level to the left, but Mario pushes beyond the limitations of a single screen if I go right. Moving forward, the player encounters their first enemy, a frustrated-looking Goomba slowly moving toward the left. Not only is this enemy moving contrary to the player's position, but its bushy, angry eyebrows will likely tip players off that this guy is probably not on the same team as our hero. Players may try to charge ahead fearlessly, thinking that this weird chestnut couldn't possibly beat a tiny man, or panic and start hitting buttons, potentially causing Mario to jump around. But, more than likely, you're expected to die on the first Goomba. Everyone's done it, it's okay, you're meant to. As the Goomba can only be cleared by jumping, this instinctively drills into a player's head that jumping is inherently good. They might even get the chance to satisfyingly squish the Goomba, made more likely due to the rigidity of Mario's momentum and higher jump arc compared to Donkey Kong and Mario Brothers, giving them a feeling of satisfaction and learning about Mario's offensive capabilities. If not, no problem. 1-1's got far more in store for him. This next block formation has come to be one of the most iconic in all of video games. Not just because it's the first actual architecture and level design in one of the most iconic games, but the way each of its individual elements work together. A single floating question mark block stands out, isolated and flashing. Even if the player had experienced games where flashing surfaces meant death, the question mark and its stark contrast to the rest of the world around it allures the player into interacting with it. As the player had to jump in order to survive the vicious Goomba attack force, they'll use their newfound power to try and get what they can out of this mysterious block. Running into it from the side doesn't seem to work, but likely by spamming jump, they'll hit the bottom of it, releasing a single coin and turning the block brown. What is this mysterious coin's purpose? To a player without an instruction manual, it's still a bit unclear, but their coin counter at the top will have increased by one. Since this counter has two digits, and collecting the coin made a satisfying noise, it stands to reason that getting 100 of these things is probably a good goal to work toward. Thus, the player has two major goals now. Collect coins, and move toward the right, in order to collect more coins. Seeing as a vast majority of games in this era worked off of the high score being the ultimate allure, and each coin nets you a cool 200 points in addition to this special coin counter, this is an excellent way to capitalize on the success of past games to introduce the player into new ways of thinking. The brown block gives off an unsatisfying on trying to hit it again. So, a player is free to move around to the following six-block formation. Having already obtained one coin from the previous question mark block, the player will likely try to score some more coins and points from these blocks, too. The bottom left block is most likely the first choice, as it's the closest and there's no real obstacle to getting it. Upon striking it, the player unwittingly unleashes the fury of the magic mushroom, slowly creeping out of the block before the fungus slides to the right. Having avoided, felled, or been felled by a very similar looking creature just seconds before, a player might think that this is another enemy, 
but won't have much time to react as the mushroom falls from its perch and bounces off a nearby pipe, lurching toward Mario. This also subtly teaches the player that enemies and items bounce off of walls and reverse their direction, but far more importantly, it ensures that the player cannot retreat from the mushroom menace. The player can't scroll the screen to the left, so retreat is out of the question, the only means of escape being to jump on or over yet another mushroom. However, the balcony of blocks is set up in such a way that a new player will very likely into one of the bricks above, knocking them down into the mushroom and forcing them to watch in horror as they... Oh, grow bigger. Miyamoto and Tezuka initially envisioned the game around Super Mario's size, before deciding that they wanted the player to feel some level of growth. Thus, Small Mario was made, and allowed the player to feel empowered by starting at a weak state that couldn't even handle a Goomba, and then doubling in size and strength. This is immediately apparent when jumping after growing. The brick blocks that had knocked Small Mario around shattering against Super Mario's mighty fist. Of course, eliminating all the blocks makes it more difficult for the player to nab the coin block at the top of the formation, but not impossible. The Magic Mushroom provides many important lessons in seconds. That all question mark blocks are valuable, even if not going for coins, and in fact many hold even more hidden surprises. That Super Mario is an immediate upgrade who can outright change level design with his fists, and to not use his power too hastily or suffer the consequences. This is followed up by three warp pipes of differing heights. The primary function of these three pipes is to teach the player about Mario's momentum and jump capabilities. Most platformers of the era had very rigid jumps. You have a jump state and a non-jump state, and that's basically it. Mario has multiple variations of jumps based on how long the player holds the jump button, so these pipes present a check for the player to make sure they're accustomed to Mario's physics or at least can hold down the button long enough to achieve his maximum jump height. There's even a little Goomba here if they fail, to provide something of a threat, and make sure the player understands the joy of squishing them underfoot if they avoided the first one. The pipes are even spaced out wide enough that a player with a running start can jump between them, something that'll be required of the player far later in the game, and letting a player who has mastered the skill take advantage and skip this part of the tutorial. A fourth pipe also blocks the player, at the same height as the third and trapping two Goombas between them. This lets the player see how Goombas interact with each other, potentially from a safe distance, and even has the chance of showing the player that they can get more points jumping off of consecutive enemies if they get trapped in the Goom Pit. Also, it is slightly weird that there are four pipes here. Normally, teaching comes in sets of three, and the fourth pipe isn't even a different height from the third, but we'll get back to that later. After surmounting the pipes, the player is presented with their first bottomless pit. Falling into its depths will instantly kill the player, even if they're Super Mario, teaching an important lesson. While the screen does scroll horizontally, it remains perfectly static vertically, and falling out of its range will always result in death. While it may seem a bit harsh to teach this lesson with the loss of a valuable life, the pit's just four pipes, four Goombas, and a couple blocks away from the start, so getting back to the hole isn't an issue. It's more than worth learning the lesson of pit bad, jump good. Though if a player were to horribly mistime their jump and hurtle directly into the pit, an invisible question mark block is present five tiles away, saving them from certain death. Additionally, a 1-up mushroom will emerge from this phantom block, rewarding the player for finding a secret with an extra chance and an extra layer of security for their future playthrough. Very few players are going to find this block on their first go-around, or even their first several go-rounds. But that hardly matters compared to the fact that one person will eventually find it. Video games were a lot smaller and more insular back in the days of Super Mario Bros. Players would share their findings on how to best survive as long as they could, or how to get the most points in a game. 
Hex the Pac-Man pattern was so commonly discussed, it entered pop culture as something instantly iconic of the era. The fact that workers or kids at school could gather at lunch and say, Dude, did you know if you jump in front of the first pit in Mario, you get an extra one man? Means that the hidden secret did its job. It also has the side effect of getting players to explore more, wondering what other hidden items could be located in the game, scouring every level for the best chance to get as far in the game and as many points in the game as possible. A player's next challenge is a pair of two Goombas, coming down from a platform above, along with another question mark block containing a power-up. The Goombas are little threat by this point, positioned so high above the player that they only really exist to show how enemies interact with gravity. A player can also experiment with trying to hit the blocks while a Goomba is on top of them, perhaps reminded of the classic Mario Bros. arcade game and learn that yes, you can kill enemies above you through bonking them from a platform below. This skill will eventually become invaluable when dealing with the Hammer Brothers later in the game, so learning it in an incredibly safe, controlled environment is all kinds of helpful. More interesting, however, is the power-up. If a player's lost their magic mushroom, they'll have the chance to nab a replacement here, if a player has maintained their super form, however, the majestic fire flower will emerge from the block, a proverbial sword in the stone. As the only things to come out of blocks are good things, players will be drawn to this new power-up, at the very least expecting a big point bonus from it. Instead, it will turn Mario's clothes white and... that's it? Now while a player could simply think that Fire Mario's white clothes give them a third hit, there is that pesky B button on the NES controller that thus far has gone totally unutilized. With just a tap, Mario forges a ball of flame to incinerate his foes, bouncing forward until it's scrolled off or made impact with a wall or enemy flesh. Not only does this safe space allow players to experiment with the Fire Flower, but the different elevations of the platforms give them room to play with how the Fire Flower interacts with gravity and striking from different elevations. And they already have a good point of reference from what to expect from the Goombas dropping down. There are even two Goombas past a pit just a bit further on, making for perfect target practice. But with great power comes great responsibility. Fire Mario does not gain a third hit, reverting back to his small form. What's important to note is, directly after this power-up block is 1-1's checkpoint, invisible to the player until they die and respawn at it. There is only one other power-up block after this checkpoint, meaning that if a player does not maintain their super state from this block, they won't have the chance to get fire for the rest of the level. In a tutorial like 1-1, that puts the value of the fire flower over like nothing else, giving the player an idea of what true power is like before taking it away. This could encourage a more careful playstyle, looking to maintain Mario's powered-up state. Or it could lead to trying to speed through the level with fire on a fresh continue, just trying to press the advantage as much as possible. What matters is that the player is given that choice on how to play, on how valuable they personally feel that power-up is. That's a weight a lot of modern games don't quite match and it's executed without a second thought here. There are three major points of interest almost immediately after the checkpoint. The first is this multi-coin block positioned directly after a pit and a pair of Goombas. The pit prevents the player from running directly past the Goombas, while the Goombas themselves slow a player's momentum so that they're likely to notice this single, isolated block. Additionally, as this is right after the checkpoint, a player is likely to get more jumpy, shall we say, and just play around more in a safer area before tackling whatever ended up killing them later on. Perhaps finding a single block a bit suspicious, the player will hit it, a single coin popping out. However, this block doesn't immediately turn solid brown after hitting it. It stays as a brick. Finding it weird, the player can hit the block again for another coin. And another one. And another one. And another one. 
As coins are the big point getters, and the player is still working on that 100 coin potential bonus, this incentivizes hitting the block as quickly as possible. However, a player who's just mashing won't be able to reach the block if Mario's small, the plumber's shortest jump height just barely missing out on pay dirt. This lets the player experiment with and find their own rhythm, further reinforcing Mario's different jump arcs. They'll have to be quick though, as if they even barely pass the block, big threat number two appears. Koopa Troopa. This hot new enemy slowly moves toward Mario, and seasoned Jumpman series veterans will know that he looks an awful lot like a Shell Creeper, one of the plumber's old foes from the sewers of Brooklyn. Now, Shell Creepers could not be jumped on in the original Mario Brothers, taking a bite out of Mario, so a veteran might attempt to avoid the turtle. However, they have this gold mine of coinage right here. Are they really gonna stop just because, ooh, scary turtle? The coin block limits their movement options, and makes it far more likely that they'll end up stepping on the Koopa, making it retreat into its shell. Even if the coin block isn't interacted with, a player coming down from the top set of platforms is in a perfect arc to interact with the Troopa. And if the player totally misses out on stomping some turtles, no big deal. 1-2 will have them covered with that interaction eventually. This just allows the player to have the chance to observe a Koopa in its natural habitat, and maybe play a bit with how it and its shell works. There's even a line of four Goombas right after to mow down with the shell. And a wall for the shell to bounce off of and potentially kill the player, sending them right back before the Koopa. The shell giveth, and the shell taketh away. The third point of interest is the Star Man hidden inside this block. Now this block could be hit while avoiding the very scary turtle, and it is relatively inconspicuous. But remember that the brick block the Starman is hidden in is just past a different brick block that contained coins. The player has learned that items, or at the very least coins, can sometimes be found inside of brick blocks, and will very likely want to test that theory on the blocks nearby to see if they have any goodies too. And lo and behold, a shining star comes leaping out. Considering this moves to the right just like the super and 1-up mushrooms and is flashing like the question mark blocks, a player is probably gonna assume it's another power-up, snatch it up, and oh boy! Music change, Mario is flashing like crazy, what is going on? Invincibility had been a common power-up in games before, and even if a player doesn't suspect that they're invincible, there's three pairs of Goombas to the right to test it on. If a player stomps on an enemy while invincible, they'll pass right through them rather than bouncing off of them. Additionally, the first Goomba couple is situated under these question mark blocks to make it difficult for Mario to properly jump on them. And the couple is so close that if Mario Starmans through the first one, the second is likely to run right into him. The remaining Goombas are then there for Mario to plow right into, before he's eventually stopped by a wall. The Starman is a player's reward for their curiosity, a sign that when faced with a hard area with a lot of enemies, searching around for that hidden gold might just save their skin. A third power-up is located above the Goomba couples, oft forgotten in quests to dash through the level with the Starman, but it is there for either completionists looking for the best score possible or those looking to improve their stamina. Of course, if a Fire Flower spawns up there, it is rather tricky to get to, forcing players to make use of Mario's momentum to make some careful jumps, and better emphasizing his air control. A high road above the four Goombas is also provided, in case a player finds a gang of four mushrooms hanging out particularly menacing. This leads to an odd, pyramid-like block formation with a gap in the middle. This will stop a player's momentum if they're dashing forward blindly with a star ban, or rudely send a Koopa Troopa shell back in their face if they're also dashing forward blindly. But the geometry is important, slowing Mario's momentum, teaching the player how to handle tight ledges where they don't have room to build up speed with Mario. And if they mess up, there's a nice bush to catch them in between the blocks. 
This tight, slow control is alleviated somewhat with the following block pyramid, which adds a column of four blocks to the pyramid's left side. This two-block landing allows Mario to get a running start and more easily leap over the now bottomless pit, safely landing on the other side, while also helping to train the player for the level's final challenge. If a player runs at full sprint and nabs the final question mark block afterward, they'll be smacked down to the ground right in front of a final pair of Goombas, potentially dying for their greed. It's a cute final lesson. Telling the player to be wary as they reach the end of levels, expecting perhaps one final challenge before they're home free. But finally, Mario reaches a grand staircase, stacking up eight blocks high before taking a great drop down to Earth. Naturally, a player will want to jump forward off the top of the really high thing, because that's fun, and humans are dumb like that, and they like jumping off the really high things. And after that leap, they'll reach a flagpole, and as the staircase blocks them from going backwards, they'll be forced to touch it, ending the level with a cute little fanfare. But the flagpole holds many secrets of its own. You achieve points no matter where you grab the flagpole, but wouldn't it stand to reason that the higher on it you are, the more points you get? But Mario can't reach the flagpole if he jumps off the top while walking. Dashing by holding B is required to get the portly plumbers behind all the way up there. By now the player has had plenty of opportunities to discover the B dash. Just by experimenting with buttons at the start, incentivized if they held down the B button and picked up the fire flower, out of pure boredom or curiosity after dying, and they've had a place to practice this jump with the second block pyramid, the warp pipe following it just two tiles further away than the flagpole. To maximize their success and point totals, the flagpole offers players one last sprint of fancy and test a skill. They might even get fireworks at the end and wonder what that's all about, trying again and testing various methods until they figure out how to get that sexy high score they've been yearning for. And despite that being the end of the level, 1-1 one, one isn't done yet. 1-2 begins with a short scene of Mario walking into a pipe and... going underground? Huh. And he even comes out of 1-2 from another pipe. This one totally vertical and looking a lot like the pipes in 1-1. One, one. Didn't 1-1 one, one also end with a small pipe in front of the staircase? I wonder, if I start pressing down on these, maybe Mario will... A bonus area flooded with coins? And it spits me out right at the end of the level? 1-1 one, one contains this bonus room and the 1-Up Mushroom to make replays of this stage all the easier and more rewarding, when the teaching tools it left behind have long since been mastered. In finding a way to let players speed through the tutorial, 1-1 one, one is complete. Now, that is a lot of factors built into a level, so much so that it's easy to think maybe we're reading too deeply into this. Maybe 1-1's one, just a good level because it was inoffensive and was the first level in one of the most important video games of all time. Maybe some of these ideas were present in development, but not all of them, and yeah, perhaps. But I like to think that 1-1 one, one is an incredibly important teaching tool. Video games were very binary in 1985. While you could employ your own strategy, usually there was a best way of achieving a high score, or they were games like King's Quest where the game was all about unraveling the one correct solution. But there is no right way to approach 1-1, just like there's no right way to beat Super Mario Bros. Is it better to take the warp pipe early on and get maximum coinage and fastest speed? Or is it better to grab the fire flower you'd miss on by taking it and using the Koopa shell to get maximum points? Is it a smarter strategy to race through the level to get a time bonus? Or to take your time and destroy everything in sight for the maximum level of style? Is it better to take the Super Mushroom at the start of 1-4? Or does the fire bar directly underneath it make it too risky? Will discovering 1-1's one, one secrets make a player want to cross new boundaries and maybe find 1-2's hidden warp zone? Heck, since this game has a definitive ending, is it even worth taking the warp zones when beating every level would yield a higher score? 
Does the high score even matter compared to how quickly I can rescue the princess? None of these questions have definitive answers, and none of them should. Miyamoto and Tezuka wanted Super Mario Bros. to be a game where each player could play in their own way, where most questions didn't have an answer, but options. And in 1-1, they certainly succeeded. 1-1 was made toward the end of Super Mario Bros. development. Miyamoto and Tezuka wanted to try out all of their ideas, including a scrap shooting segment, before making the game's debut level. And even Kondo composed a traditional waltz theme for the underwater stages before taking on the more contemporary main theme. Heck, when they were designing 1-1, Goomba hadn't even been invented yet, and they scrambled to figure out what sprite they could make into a simple enemy to start the player out with, instead of slotting in the more complex Koopa and its shell mechanics. Because of this, 1-1 is reflective of absolutely everything Super Mario Bros. wants to be. Some levels later in the game are designed with rather traditional thinking. One way and one way alone being the valid way through the level, or a particular set of mechanics being absolutely required, leading to... Oh! It was right there! The axe was right there! I can see the axe! He can take... Ah! Ah! Mixed results at times. This tutorial has the benefit of learning from those, exposing the player to the most important points the game wants to highlight, and teaching them without saying a word, leaving it up to the player to learn what the best way for them to play is. That's a lesson that can be spread to all games. Build your beginnings to set your tone, give a feel for your game, and let the player explore all the most important aspects that they'll learn to love. Even if your game is breaking from conventional gameplay or traditional wisdom, hey, so did Mario. And if a budding industry can do it, you certainly can. Super Mario Bros. is legendary. 1-1 is legendary. But it's ultimately a game. It's ultimately just the intentions of the designers coded for you to have fun with it. And just like Mario, you can make the start of a wonderful journey. As long as you lay it down. Brick. By. Brick.